Saimi and I feel honoured to have been invited to contribute to this inaugural Nazim Hikmet Research Centre Conference at Bosphorus University. We are sorry not to be able to attend it in person, for we are both very impressed by the programme. So many scholars of a younger generation are clearly undertaking cutting-edge research in this field. We hope that our account of our own journey through the landscape of Nazim Hikmet's life and work will provide a useful framework for further research. First, I'd like to emphasize the primary reason why 30 years ago, we decided to start writing about the life and work of Nazim Hikmet. We wanted to show to the English speaking world how Turkey's greatest modern poet combined political commitment with an adventurous personal life. Hence the title we chose, Romantic Communist communist to focus on his political commitments, romantic to take account of the intense personal feelings expressed in his poetry. But Saimi and I did not, did not treat these two themes separately. We attempted to show how they converged, how ideas and feelings are brought together through a compelling creative temperament. As a cultural historian, I found this task very exciting. But my, mon my knowledge of the Turkish language was very basic, so the book required the closest possible collaboration between me and Saimi, drawing on her cultural heritage. I would like to start saying that I'm not a very literary person. At school, I loved maths and science, and my main subject at the university was theoretical physics. There were virtually no books in our home, when I was growing up in Malatya in 1940s. But there was a second-hand bookshop that we rented novels from uh, Per Crusha Day. My sister and I would borrow books from that shop. They included translation of French and Russian novels published by the Turkish Ministry of Education. We were introduced to poetry by my father who used to read and recite poetry by Nazar Mikmet, Nazan Tefik and many others. That was very different from the verses that we learned from the textbooks at school. On my first day at school, our teacher asked us to recite a song or a poem. I stood up proudly and began to recite from my memory. Kışta karda rüzgarlarda Açlar ölür sokaklarda. When my sister, my teacher said, sit down. I was shocked and could not understand why. Unfortunately, I do not remember the rest of the poem or the name of the author. Perhaps it will ring a bell in someone in this audience. These were the poems that I could understand because they were connected poetry with social reality. My father was a Salak memor, and one of his duty was to check the health of the prisoners in Malatya prison. One of those prisoners was Kemal Tahir. Of course, as you know, he was a close friend of Nazam Hikmet. At that date, Nazam was serving a long prison term in Bursa prison, so was Kemal Tahir. And Nazem Hikmet was writing his famous narrative poem, Human Landscape. He and Kemal Tahir were allowed to exchange letters. That's an important source of understanding of the development of Turkish political poetry. In 1963, Saimi was awarded a scholarship to study in England at the newly founded University of Sussex. There was a wonderful atmosphere at that university. The founders had devised what they called a new map of learning. Science students were encouraged to mix with those from the humanities and even attend each other's lectures in an art science scheme. As a newly appointed junior lecturer in German teaching European studies, I had my office in the arts building. But over lunch, we would mingle with students from the sciences and this is how I was introduced to Saimi. When a group of us met for coffee in Saimi's room, I saw a poem which she had pinned to the wall. Bugün 
Passar. Bokun Passar. Bokun Benny Ilkdefa Gunesheche Kartala. Today is Sunday, I said. What's so special about going out into the sunshine on a Sunday morning? Simon explained that at the time, back in 1938, Nazem was in prison and had been held in solitary confinement. He wrote the poem to convey a sudden sense of liberation, the tension between imprisonment and a joyous openness to the outside world. Now, in 1963, after Nazem Hikmet had died in exile in Moscow, his poems were at last beginning to be republished, as Simi explained. Inspired by Simi's stories, by reading Nazem's poetry in the English translations that were beginning to appear, and inspired also by political histories, such as Bernard Lewis's The Emergence of Modern Turkey, I could hardly wait to experience life in Turkey at first hand. The opportunity came in 1970. Simi and I were married by this time, and she was employed as a lecturer in physics at Middle East Technical University in Ankara. I joined her there for a year, teaching a course on European history of ideas. We focused on modern thinkers like Charles Darwin and Karl Marx. But the topic that Turkish students found most interesting was the modernization of Christianity initiated 500 years ago by Martin Luther. Luther was the German Protestant leader who attacked the Catholic Church and launched the Reformation. Was it like the schism between the Shiites and the Sunnis, asked one of my students. But that old age dispute over the heritage of the prophet lacked the modernizing dynamic of the Christian Reformation. Ah, so now we understand, the students sadly concluded, why the Islamic nations have resisted modernization. One of our most inspirational experiences during that year in Turkey was meeting the painter Ibrahim Balaban at an exhibition of his work in Istanbul. As a young man, Balaban had spent several years in Bursa prison where he was befriended by Nazim Hikmet. It was Nazim who encouraged Balaban to become a painter. The exhibition where we were introduced to Balaban included his series of paintings on the Urkusler theme. You see one on the screen. You may see a painting behind me on the wall. When we talked to Balaban about that painting and said how we would like to buy it, we said we couldn't possibly afford it on the salary of a university lecturer. But he said, I would far prefer to sell my paintings to socialists rather than to rich collectors. You can pay in instalments. And this is what we did. And this is why the painting is hanging on the wall behind me. When we asked Balaban what he intended to express in this painting, he said that it symbolized the exploitation of labor and the backwardness of life in rural, in rural communities. My own feeling is that the two oxen yoked together, pulling in opposite directions, symbolized and maybe today still, still symbolizes the contradictions of modern Turkey. From the meeting with Balaban, we learned two things that were to prove important for a biography of Nazim Hikmet. First, Nazim never worked in isolation. He always had around him what he called his social family, friends and lovers, writers and artists. So to understand Nazim, we would have to take into account other key figures from the Turkish avant-garde. Second, at that time, many of those people were still alive and they were more than willing, like Balaban, to share with us their memories of the period. So oral history research could prove extremely important for our book. The early 1970s were a period of student revolts and cultural revolutions, not least in Turkey. We hope to change the world in the spirit of Nazim's political vision. On the wall of the apartment in Ankara, where we were staying, we had a poster depicting a flaming torch together with the famous lines, Ben yanmaz sam, sen yanmaz san, biz yanmaz sak, nasl chikar karan lukla aydan la. 
At the end of 1970, we returned to England, where I taught at the University of Cambridge. We didn't change the world, but in Cambridge we did succeed in radicalising the teaching programme by means of a course on literature and politics. With a group of younger colleagues, I organised a series of lectures on left-wing and modernist writers and artists like Auden, Breton, Benjamin, Gramsci, Mayakovsky and Eisenstein. The course was so popular that a leading academic publisher asked us to edit the lectures in book form. And on the screen you will see the cover of the book, Visions and Blueprints, published in 1988 by Manchester University Press, featuring a poster for Eisenstein's famous film, Battleship Potemkin. When Edward was discussing with me this book about the European avant-garde, I insisted on including Nazism. He surely deserved to be included alongside other political poets such Aragon and Brecht. So this is how our journey began. We co-authored a 15-page article entitled <coughs> Nazism Met Poetry and Politics in Kemalist Turkey, which duly appeared in the book. Soon after it appeared, another publisher who specialized in socialist literature offered to publish a full biography of Nazim Hikmet if we decided to write it. It's not yet possible for a publisher in Turkey to issue full editions of Nazim's writing. But in the mid-1960s, a Turkish language publisher in communist Bulgaria produced an eight-volume edition of Nazim's work, edited by Ekber Babayev, a Turkish scholar teaching in Moscow. And we have this image of this first volume of that edition. This edition became one of our treasured possessions. Its great advantage from the point of view research is that they pro provided the date of uh, composition for Nazim's poem and arranged them in a chronological order. This chronological principle provided a firm textual basis for a life and works approach, extending from patriotism of Nazim's teenage verses to his late poetry about living in exile in Moscow and grieving about separation. We also began to collect chronological sequence of photos, cartoons and other images to enhance our narrative. We now come to the question, what were our main sources? What we experienced as researchers was truly a creative uh, and collective endeavour. We were able to draw on previous publications by many other scholars. Studies and memoirs of Nazim by Vala Nuratin and Ekba Babayev, by Azim Bezaji and Kemal Sulka, by Zakaria Sertel and Yildiz Sertel. Also, letters, newspaper articles, TV documentaries, and of course, Nazim's own writings, poems and plays, novels, stories, articles, even humorous sketches. The 28 volumes of the fine Adam Yayanlaro edition published in 1987 by Mehmet Fuad filled some of the gaps left by the Babayev edition. We also researched the history of the Turkish Communist Party and other aspects of culture and politics in Turkey. It was Saimi who sifted through these Turkish sources, writing summaries in English and identifying key questions for further research. My main contribution can be summed up in a single phrase, narrative structure. Drawing on this wealth of sources, we prepared a detailed 30-page chronological outline of Nazim's life, including his travels and, of course, his publications. On this basis, it became possible to identify significant discrepancies and omissions in previous accounts of the poet's writings. The first intriguing question, which we still have difficulty in answering definitively, was what exactly was Nazim's date of birth? It was a tangled question involving conflicting family memories and conversions between Islamic and Western calendars. We opted for 5th 15th of January 1902 as the most likely date, based on research by Azim Bezaji. Bezaji cited Nazim's mother Jelile's notes about the day of his birth. 
But more recently, this date of birth has been challenged on the basis of another document, Memdu Ezine's memoirs, which you can see on the screen, uh, written in Ottoman script. I cannot read Ottoman script, but I understand that according to the commentary by Tara Torres on this document, it suggests that the date of birth was 17th of January, not 15th of January. Against this, and you'll see another document in a moment, in the registry uh, list at Kadikoy, compiled many years later in the 1930s, Nazim's birthday is again registered as 15th of January. So we have to leave it there without knowing the precise date. Particularly important for our view of Nazim as a romantic communist was the question of his attitude to Stalin. We know that during the 1930s he wrote a pamphlet about Soviet democracy featuring an image of Stalin. You see the cover of this pamphlet on the screen, published in 1936 in Turkey. But we also know that Nazim was consistently critical of the cult of the individual. He rejected the idea that history is made by great men. So how did he resolve this tension between romantic communism and what one might call dogmatic communism? To find answers to such key questions, it was clear that systematic double-checking had to be done. This took two main forms, as you'll now hear from Simi, archival research and oral history. The most important collections that I visited were several archives in Moscow, Amsterdam, Budapest, and the Turkish parliamentary archives in Ankara, and best of all, Aziz Nesn archive in Çatalca. I visited the Nazem Hikmet archives in Moscow twice and checked the archives of peace movement. Since my knowledge of Russian is very basic, I was gratefully grateful to the, for the help of Radifish, who had himself written a biography of Nazem. It was frustrating to find that not all material was available in, for inspection, but I was able to photocopy some of the important resources. They included a list of over 1,000 publications in Russian by Nazem in relating to his work. Here you could see the image of the bibliography of Nazem works in Russian. You'll see that this list Nazem's poem on the death of Stalin on 5th of March 1953. It probably first appeared in Turkish in Sechil Mishirler, published in Sofia in 1954. Devlet Neshriyat here you could see the poem published in 1954. Caught up in the emotion in the moment, Nazem wrote this poem on the following day. Stalin is not mentioned by name, but it's of course Stalin that is meant when he writes Seviyor Mone, Marxe, Engelse, Lenine, Sevdiyim Gibi, Sevdiyim Es Gibi. I love him just as I love Marx, Engels, Lenin, just as we love them. A further sign of admiration for Stalin at that time is documented by the handwritten document which we discovered in the edition of Moskova Symphonisi, Genshlik Yainar Sofia, published in 1952. Here you could see the image of this, this symphony, inscription by Nazem. There underneath it says, it is Stalin's hand that carries the flag for life and peace. Hayatın ve barışın bayrağını tutan el Stalin'in elidir. Apart from spending time in the archives, I visited Nazım House in Georgia Deja Street. His widow Vera, her daughter and the grandchild were living there. I also had to visit Dacia at the writer's colony in Paradel Kino, in the middle of Karl Kain Orman, of course, where he lived with his doctor friend Galinia for seven years. Here is the image of that house that I took a picture of in Paradel Kino. Of course by that time Galinia retired and she was living in Siberia. I was corresponding with her regularly 
We managed to interview her with the help of a student who spoke Russian. Galinia sent her collection of postcards and cuttings now in Boazici archives. In the Hungarian theater archives, I discovered a list of Nazem's plays staged in the Soviet bloc. For example, his play about Ferhat and Shirin, better known as Legend of Love, was a great success when it was premiered in 1953. Here I see the picture of that play, a photograph of that play. In the Hungarian radio archive, I listened to recordings of Nazem's his own voice, derived from the broadcast he made in Budapest Radio in 1954. All these recordings are available now in CDs, of course. Take up the archives in Amsterdam helped me to piece together Nazem's position in Communist Party and the state of the party during the years of turmoil 1926 and 36. There could be no doubt about Nazem's disillusionment with the Kemalist regime due to its anti-communist measure. But we made an exciting discovery relating to Kemal Atatürk's view of Nazem's poetry. In the early 1920s, Nazem had written a satirical poem criticizing the forms of superstition and religious dogma under the title of Meshin Kaplı Kitap, book with leather jacket cover, or holy book. In the Take Copy archive, we found the following confidential report dealing and dating the 25th of February 1927, written in French. Here's our translation of Take Copy report of 1927. Quote. As far as Nazem's concerned, this poem about holy book, recently published in a literary review in Istanbul, was read by Mustafa Kemal, who was very enthusiastic about it. When members of his entourage intimated that the author was a communist, Kemal apparently replied, who cares what he is? One thing is certain, no one has ever written anything as powerful as this in the Turkish language." Unquote. In Amsterdam, I also obtained transcripts of some of the talks broadcast by the Wism Radio in Leipzig. Unpublished manuscripts that were shared with me by two contributors to Wism Radio gave me further insight into the activities of the TKP around 1958. Since then, this, this radio transcript has also been published by Twista, Wism Radio Danazem. Now, finally, we come to Aziz Nesin archives in Chatalja. That proved particularly helpful. Nesin made several visits to Moscow and collected a vast amount of material relating to Nazem. When he serialized his findings in Watan in 1978, 1976, they caused controversy because of his interpretation of certain aspects of Nazem's private life. But the material he collected is invaluable including many otherwise inaccessible newspapers cutting, unpublished letters, and photographs. Among the most valuable items I discovered in that archive were three letters written by Munever. Women with whom Nazim lived in 1950 and 51 and had a son before he escaped from Turkey. Here is the letter from Munever to Nazim, which is now in Aziz Nesin archives. She and Nazem corresponded regularly during the following 10 years until Munevar herself escaped from Turkey in 1961. The full sequence of the letters are still in Moscow archives, but from the few letters that Aziz Nesin copied, we were able to reconstruct some crucial details about their relationship. We gained a clear understanding of Munevar's knowledge about Nazem's relationship with his new Russian wife, Vera, it was the feelings involved in this love triangle that the poet expressed in a poem, Two Loves. At first, it was unclear whether Nazem was already married to Vera before Minever escaped from Turkey to join him in exile. Even when I asked Vera during an interview, she claimed that she did not remember the date of her marriage to Nazem. I had to write to Russian consulate, and here's the date that they provided. 
Here's the image of the letter I got from the consulate. As you will see, Nazem and Mure were married on the 18th of November 1960. So by the time Minerva and her son Mehmet were re reunited with Nazem in Warsaw in July 61, he was indeed ma already married to Vera. Focusing on oral history interviews, I would begin by saying that Saimi has a great gift for listening to people, people who want to share their experiences and problems with her. She now works as a psychotherapist. I had also developed a flair for oral history interviews myself during my research in Cambridge, working on other topics. So Saimi and I conducted a significant number of oral history interviews together, over 35 in total, the names and dates are listed at the back of our book. Saimi took the lead, but by this date my understanding of Turkish had improved and I could follow the discussion and raise additional points if I felt that questions remained unanswered. We interviewed some of, Saimi, we interviewed some of Nazem's earlier biographers, some of his family members, friends, comrades and lovers. Often it took several visits to build trust. In some cases we used a tape recorder, but more often it seemed easier to rely simply on notes. Almost everyone welcomed the opportunity to collaborate on, with a book on Nazem to be published in English. They appreciated the fact that we were trying to give a balanced and comprehensive account of Nazem's career, not to promote the interests of a, of a particular political faction. One of our first interviews was with Guzin and Abedin Dino. We were introduced to them in London at the home of another of Nazem's admirers, Nermin Menemenjola. Nermin, as a university student in the 1930s, had interviewed Nazem in Istanbul. They met at the office of his publisher, Ahmed Khalid, in Barbayale. Nermin then composed the first article in English devoted to Nazem's poetry which was published in 1932 in the journal, The Bookman. So it was an honor for us to meet Nermin and even to hear her reciting Nazem's poems. We then visited Guzun and Abedin Dino in Paris to record memories of their meetings and their collaboration with Nazem. Abedin illustrated Nazem's poetic works, as you'll see from the image on the screen, one of his illustrations for the poem human landscapes. It was Gusin Dino who arranged in July 1996 for us to meet Munava Andach, mother of Nazem's only child. This interview was perhaps the most rewarding of all. Munava was living in Paris and translating Nazem's work into French. In the 30 years since Nazem's death, Munava had never given any interview about the poet or about her relationship with his work. However, when we sent her sections of our manuscript concerning her and her son Mehmet, she generously agreed to meet us. It gave her the opportunity for her personal story to be heard on certain crucial points. We were also privileged to meet Nazem's stepson, Mehmet Fuat. As a son of Pirae, he was able to clarify certain aspects of Piraya's life with Nazem. Piraya herself had lived until 1995, but she steadfastly refused to be interviewed or to publish her memoirs. Oral history, memoir, oral history interviews are often regarded as a problematic source. The memories of those interviewed may be unreliable, the interviewers may misinterpret what is said, but we did our best to check the interview material against other sources and after we'd interviewed people and written up the results, we sent them the sections involving their contributions so as to ensure that we had recorded them correctly. Mehmet Fuat was one of those who provided scholarly annotations on the margins of the printout from our draft biography, which we sent to him before publication. You see on the screen a page from our biography in draft with Mehmet Fuat's hand, um, writ comments written in his own handwriting across the bottom of the page, explaining certain details about Piraya's attitude to Nazem. We had attempted in our manuscript to define Piraya's attitude towards communism, 
saying that she was not a particularly political person. Mehmet Fuat helped to clarify and elucidate this. He also corrected details about their domestic life after they had moved, uh, Nazem and Piraye had moved with other members of the family uh, to set up house in Erenkoy in the 1930s. Other valuable interviews were with Niall Chakohan and his wife Harlet Chamba. Niall was a close friend of Nazem and active in the Turkish Communist Party in the 1930s. Their comments clarified many disputes regarding Nazim's expulsion from the Turkish Communist Party and his attempts to set up an opposition group within the party. To clarify Nazim's attitude to communism in a later period, in the Soviet Union, after 1951, we were fortunate enough to meet and interview the Russian poet Yevgeny Yevchashenko, who knew Nazim well in Russia. Yevchashenko kindly agreed to write an introduction to our book. In addition, we corresponded with people that we were not able to meet in person. This was particularly important in the case of Nazim's Italian translator, Joyce Lusu, the woman who helped Munavir to escape from Turkey in 1961. Joyce Lusu wrote her own memoir describing her involvement with this escape. We checked and double-checked her account of this episode during our interview with Munavir, whose memories differed on some details. We then had to try to arrive at a balanced assessment of the situation. The final draft of this section of the book was sent to both Joyce Lusu and to Munavir for confirmation. Having set out to reduce Nazan biography to the English-speaking world, we are happy about the result. I'd like to mention sort of a couple of examples. Three years after the publication of The Romantic Communists, we managed, with the help of Arcola Theatre in London, to attract 1,000 people to Queen Elizabeth Hall in London for a programme to celebrate Nazim's 100th birthday. Performance included Genjo Elkal, Haluk Bilginer, Julie Christie, Adrian Mitchell, and Kachaturian Plikian. Here is the program of that Nazim's 100th birthday. Question of disseminating Nazim's uh, writings in Spanish-speaking world came into a focus when we learned that one of the great uh, admirers, uh, Nazim's great admirers, was Che Guevara. We were contacted by the author Lucio Alvarez, who was writing a biography of Che. She asked us to check a line by Nazim Hikmet, quoted in one of Che's letters, written from prison in 1956, which quote, I'll take with me the grave, the sorrow of an unfinished song. We traced it to the poem that Nazem Hikmet wrote in prison in November 1933, addressed to Piraye. Yarı kalmış bir türkünün acısını toprağa götüreceğim. From this biography, we also know that she owned books by Nazem in Spanish translation including the novel Yaşamak Güzel Şey Kardeşim. And this is quoted in Che, che Guevara's, uh, Alvarez books on Che Guevara, page 171. Here is the book, image of the book. An Iraqi writer named Hussein Majid, who was researching on Nazim influence in Arabic literature, also contacted us for details. His article was published in January 19, 2015 in Halal in Cairo under the title Nazim Hikmet, the poet of freedom from prison to exile. Here he writes, Nazim was the great river digging deeply into our land. We know the source, but the estuary and branches are still obscure. Nowadays, it's difficult to say that this or that poet is influenced by Nazim Nazim exists in all contemporary Arab poetry. So difficult to imitate his simplicity, he has a unique poetic fabric. There's just time to share with you one further example, an illustrated edition of Save Down the Bullet, the scenario which is written by Nazim and Mira. Here is the image uh, of that book, 
published in Arabic in France. We are pleased to hear that translation of Nazm into different languages is becoming a subject of research at the university, and Vazici University has got many of examples. We were even contacted by a translator from Pakistan, Masud Akhtar Shaikh, about translation of Nazm into Urdu and Punjabi, as well as English, as his English translation was published in 2007 in Islamabad, called Hundred Man Poems of Nazam Hikmet, a Romantic Revolutionary Poet. And it's interesting, this book, it divided into section Nazam Love Poem, Patriotic Poems, and Longing for the Country Poems, and, and it was very, very interesting, divided. Finally, an Armenian academic, Eddie Arnovidian, contacted us, telling us about translation of Nazam poetry by the Armenian communist poet, Yagishe Cherens. So, there must be many more interested around the world. Thank you. Saime has just been talking about the importance of research on Nazam's work in translation into many different languages, and sometimes through different languages. I would like, in conclusion, to encourage research on two further themes. The first is letters. Nazim was a wonderful letter writer, and this enabled us to give an intimate account not only of his ideas, but also of his feelings. His letters from prison to Piraye are particularly well known. Equally important may be his extensive correspondence with Minerva during the years 1951 to 1961, letters which were not available to us for our research. Nazan's letters to Minerva are, we assume, in the possession of her son, Mehmet Andac. Minerva's letters are preserved in the Mar Mar Moscow archives, but as I say, we did not have access to them, apart from three examples that Saimi has mentioned. There are apparently over 800 of these letters from Minerva to Nazan. If some future researcher is able to make a detailed study of both sides of this Nazan Minerva correspondence, it's likely to prove an exceptionally illuminating source. And then archives, Soviet archives. Saimi has mentioned the Russian archives she visited, and this brings me to my final point about the research agenda the need for further study of Nazim's last years in the Soviet Union by researchers fluent in both Turkish and Russian. We have already shared with you an excerpt from the 1,000 item list of Nazim related publications in Russian. There must surely also be a mass of unpublished materials, for example, in the Soviet Writers Union archives or in the archives of the KGB which would reward a critical study. So in conclusion, only by bringing political archives and personal letters together can the picture of the Romantic Communist be made more complete. Thank you so much for watching.